Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I want to do one more time to see how this is working. So, yeah, I'm going to be great. standing by the podium. When okay. you were standing in the center of the room, it was better. How about now? No. Not, not good. So I'm going to have to go to that mic. Okay. Yeah, how did you hear me before? So Jessica. Standing there, standing there is good, Jeff. Standing there is good. Good. That's what we're going to do. We're just going to stand here then. And everybody in the room here in Pierre can hear OK. We're good. Super. And folks out there on the virtual land can hear OK. Correct. A thumbs up. All right. We're going to go. Wow. OK, let's go ahead and get started, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for uh, kind of our uh, September State Technical Committee meeting. Glad to have you all here. We have a nice room full um, here in Huron. You're seeing a few of those folks in on camera, but we also have an amazing crowd that is joining us now remotely. So thank you so much. As you can tell just from the few minutes that we just went through, this is kind of new ground for many of us. Uh, someone was just saying uh, earlier today, Carl was telling me if he had a quarter for every time, he said that we're just trying to find our way through this new situation that we find ourselves in that we he would be a rich man so carl not going to give you those dollars but i think your your observation is good so anyway um really glad to have you all we have a lot to go over with you today uh, through this effort and so please bear with us the best we can i think we'll be able to take some questions that will come up and visit about that i i really believe that um for the sake of kind of time and camera and things like that, one of our normal traditions is to do introductions. I think that's going to be a little bit difficult to navigate through that. Um, so I think what we'll do is forego that day and we'll try to do our very best to make sure that if someone wants to make comments that they can do a quick introduction of themselves. And that will also what we'll also do is make sure that we get the best uh, list published of all the folks who were here. So we'll try to make sure we capture all you as attendees, both virtually and in person, and make sure that we share that out with so everyone can hear, or, or everyone can know who was here and who joined us. So thank you. Very good. Well, thank you again. So um, with that, I'm going to make just a few opening comments, and then we'll go ahead and get started. And I'm going to be calling on some of our congressional representat representatives that are with us today. To make a few comments during that time and then they may have some other comments they want to make throughout the meeting as well so this has been an interesting year as we talked about it's not just the whole covid situation but it's also really about us being able to try to find out how we are rolling out our farm bill programs many of you in the room um, who we speak with often uh, have are aware that NRCS has tried to roll out this year several new computer programs, um, software programs to try to help us do a better job nationally of capturing outcomes and things like that with our programs. I think in the end, it will be a really good spot for us to be, but that doesn't mean that any time you go to a good spot, there's not growing pains along the way, Mike. And this year we've had definitely our share of growing pains. So we've gone through a lot of that. The good news is, is that we are sitting here today on the 16th of September um, with the end of the fiscal year rapidly approaching us. And we have literally gotten all of our dollars, um, farm bill dollars obligated. And so we've got just a handful. I think maybe we're down to a couple of equips and less than 10 conservation stewardship applications to get finished up. All of our ASEP um, applications have been moved and obligated and sent in. We're still finalizing a few of our agreements for some of our technical assistance dollars. Um, if uh, I, I don't know that we'll have anybody on with uh, farm, farm service agency, but I can tell you that we had a large CRP workload in South Dakota this year, and we were able to get that wrapped up by last Friday. And there's a few signatures that are going on. So I feel really proud 
of the NRCS people and all the partners that we work with for accomplishing this workload. It was a busy year. You're going to hear more about that, but we really banded together and got it done. So thank you to all of you online. Um, thank you, uh, to you, all of you in this room that helped us accomplish that. I think it's going to be good for conservation and good for the police. So we're pleased that we're pleased to share a lot of those updates with you today. So second on the agenda is uh, for some of our congressional representatives to speak with us. Um, Ryan Donnelly is joining us from Washington, D.C., works with uh, Senator Thune. And Ryan right now appears to be froze up a little bit. Maybe he's going to come through. Ryan, if you can hear me and if you're uh, free right now, would you like to make a few opening comments? Ryan might have lost connectivity there for a second. He did look froze up. Um, okay, Joe, would you like to join us? Um, I'm going to have you come forward and I'll step out of the way. Maybe you'd like to make a few comments as well. Uh, morning, uh, Joe Bliss with Senator Ryan's office. Thanks for the I hate to interrupt you, but can you stand right in front of the computer? Okay, yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. The cell phone commercial. Um, so I, I just wanted to, you know, obviously it's sort of a contentious time. We've got an election coming up and we're trying to potentially no negotiate out uh, uh, some of the extension of COVID relief legislation, especially the most popular items um, like PPP, that's proven to be difficult. I think with the different um, competing priorities, I can, I don't know, Ryan, if you heard that part, but I, I told the group that we're going to have Ryan Donnelly uh, kind of touch on uh, uh, a lot of this, so we'll rely on his expertise, but um, so that, that's an ongoing thing. I think we're going to be in through early October. They might lop off uh, one week. Uh, in October of session time uh, as we grow closer to another election. Um, one thing we are pushing in front of this corona situation that we've suffered through this year is our meat inspection bill, which I think a lot of you are familiar with, uh, that allows state inspected meat facilities in South Dakota to use that or sell that product uh, across state lines. We think that the food supply, I mean, if this year didn't prove it, I mean, the, our food supply system is too consolidated. We need competition. It's in the best interest of consumers to seek that kind of competition. It's in the best interest of food security to have that type of competition. So we're continuing to push that as one part of many to make sure that our supply chain is less consolidated. Um, and at the end of the day, we think it comes down to, you know, an unnecessary regulation that you can sell these products safely within state, but you can't uh, sell it interstate, even though uh, those safety standards do meter and feed the pre-existing federal standards. So I'll just touch on two more things. Um, phase one, on the China purchases, you know, it seems like that's on a good pace. I mean, it's a tough year to maybe hit that, but, you know, I think it's our obligation to Congress and obviously with the executive branch to keep pressuring China to make those purchases that they committed to. And so that's going to be huge. And, you know, Jeff might know more. Um, CFAP details are coming soon. Brian might be able to add more, but uh, again, just, Thanks for the opportunity to come listen to the technical meeting and you know get some information and want to provide a little insight onto what our office is working on, what Senator Rounds is working on. So we appreciate that. Thank you. Ryan, it looks like you're able to or have joined us back and it looks like you're live and I can see your head moving now so you're not froze up. That's great news. Good to see you. 
Um, we're going to have you go next, sir. And then what we'll do is if there's some questions from the group, maybe we can have Joe come back up and the two of you could tackle those together. So um, I'll turn it over to you, Ryan. Thank you so much for taking time to join us today. Thanks, Jeff. Can you guys hear me? It heads nodding here in the room and I'm sure live. So proceed. All right, glad to hear it. My uh, Wi-Fi cut out there for a minute. So sorry I hopped off, but I'm back now. I'm Ryan Donnelly. I'm Senator Thune's Ag Legislative Assistant uh, based out here in DC. Um, I don't have a whole lot to add on top of what um, Joe has already covered. Um, you know, we're obviously looking at appropriations legislation, uh, probably a continuing resolution um, either through December or early next year um, to, to fund the government. Um, one thing we'll be looking at as part of that uh, appropriations legislation uh, will be uh, funding for the Commodity Credit Corporation. Uh, obviously, that funding is being used now for um, CFAP, the direct assistance to producers, but we've also got um, commodity and conservation program payments that will be due here in, you know, at the beginning of the next fiscal year, and um, that'll be a priority for us to make sure that USDA has the, the funds needed to uh, get us get program payments out the door to producers. Um, Joe had mentioned CFAP. We do expect uh, more details on that, hopefully this week yet. Uh, on you know a potential second round of assistance for producers, um, and then I guess one other thing I wanted to touch on is uh, the Soil Health and Income Protection Program uh, that was included in the 2018 Farm Bill, and it's a three to five year set aside program um, within the Conservation Reserve Program, uh, and the deadline to sign up for for the program um, was extended from August 21st to November 20th. Uh, so that's something, uh, a program that was a you know a high priority for Senator Thune in the Farm Bill, and um, glad to see that the the sign up was extended, and uh, would appreciate any any feedback or thoughts you guys have on the program, or you know ideas for improvement as we uh, continue working to implement the Farm Bill. Um, but that's it for me, and thanks again for the opportunity to join today. Ryan, thank you so much. Um, so if I could, Joe, if you want to come at least be up close up front, I would open it up for a few questions for Ryan and Joe. So um, we'll just kind of go ahead and see how that turns out. So any questions from the room here, I can try to repeat those back to them. Or are there any questions from any of the folks joining us virtually? All right, Mike. So Mike Schmidt, livestock producer from Moody County, wondering about any updates on uh, price discovery on the livestock side of things. So if I didn't do that very well, Joe heard that as well. Uh, he might have some more details. I don't know if you can hear me now. Yeah, just, okay. I just want to add some top line stuff that I think the Senator want, would want me to add. On all that price discovery, our meat inspection bill, uh, country of origin issues, um, this whole thing's gonna be an uphill battle. And I mean, this is gonna be a real fight because there's some real, I mean, as we know, entrenched special interest groups that don't wanna see any additional market competition. They don't wanna see labeling issues, even if it's worked out on a trade basis. Um, so I, I can let Donnelly kind of give maybe, you know, what's the status of affairs right now with this concerted effort that our delegation is going through, uh, along with a lot of different, you know, rural senators that are on, that get it and understand the cattle issues. You know, when we go out in the communities and we see it and talk to people. Um, so I just wanted to add that, you know, this is going to be a, a, a fight that we're, we're going to have to continue a multi-year fight. But I'll, I'll let Ryan kind of touch on any specific details. Yeah, thanks, Joe. And yeah, I agree. It is going to be an uphill battle that we'll continue to to have here. Um, probably won't all be resolved this year, but we will keep working at it. Um, in the Senate Ag Committee, we've got mandatory price reporting reauthorization, and that the current authorization expires at the end of this fiscal year. 
So here at the end of September, and you know we haven't reached an agreement yet on what a, a long-term reauthorization will look like, um, but hopefully we can get a short-term extension included in a continuing resolution or you know the the bill that will uh, maintain funding for the government here in the short term, and then you know continue working towards a long-term agreement on mandatory price reporting. Thank you. All right, here you are. We'll go ahead. Ryan, for your uh, involvement with us today. Appreciate that much. Next on the agenda is a soil health update. Um, there's uh, quite a few people in the room and live that can help us with this, but a couple of our specialists who normally speak with us. Uh, specifically Ken Veleger, who is our state soil health specialist, was tied up today. So you're going to get just kind of a simple update from me. So sorry about that. But the main update that I want to give to you is, is that South Dakota and the partnership has put together a uh, new handbook. The folks here... We're able to uh, be able to publish this and it's out now. And I know Cindy is putting it out this week with her uh, newsletter and some things like that. And so this is going to hit South Dakota. So all of you interested in soil health, I really encourage you to get your hands on one of these handbooks. It'll be on the NRCS website. It's going to be on the Soil Health Coalition's website. A really good document it took a long time and we're just happy all as a partnership to have it out and available for producers across South Dakota and beyond our borders as well. So thank you so much. With that, uh, Levi, do you have anything else that you'd like to add, sir? Are you okay? Levi's given me the thumbs up. Uh, all this technology is scaring off some of these people, including me. So anyway, we'll just kind of handle it that way. If any other questions come up on soil health later on, please let us know. The last thing that I'll share about soil health is, is I've had a chance to travel around the state recently, spending some time with some producers. And just last Thursday, I was in a meeting and some producers were telling me it was a landowner operator. And you don't too many times run into both of those people at the same time in a meeting. But anyway, we were visiting and they said, hey, Jeff, when you leave here, make sure you take a look at the north side of the gravel road and please take a look at the south side of the gravel road as well. And so I stopped along the road and I took a couple of pictures. And what I seen is one side of that road had been farmed with a soil health system from since about, um, I think they told me 1996, seven, somewhere in that neighborhood. So about 22, 23 years. And the soybeans on that side of the road, look, were taller, they were greener. They, in just in a lot of ways, look like it was going to be a better crop. It'll I'll find out. On the south side of the road, it had been more traditional in its cropping system, and it's how it was planted. It was tilled before, and it was a more corn-soybean rotation, and those beans looked like they were hurting a lot from the lack of rain that this part of the state had had in the month of August. So once again, this year has shown us that soil health systems definitely do um, help us be resilient. We don't know what Mother Nature is going to throw our way, but we know that we can prepare and our soils can be better able to handle it. And I think that's the message that we just want to continue to carry forward across our state to help our state be in the best situation. So thank you for all of you that are working together to make soil health go farther in South Dakota. Next, we have another exciting thing that we want to do for you. We're going to show you some technology. I'm going to tell just a little bit of a story to get it started, and then we're going to bring Mark Larson up. So over my eight and a half years with you in South Dakota, numerous times I've had producers talk to me about the need to tile and the decision of whether tile drainage should be put in the ground. And many people have said that, you know, they, they hear a lot from a lot of different individuals that it will pay back. It will provide them a profit. 
And you know, what I've always just encouraged producers to do is, while I'm not telling you that tile is good or tile is bad, what I do tell you to make to do is make the best informed decision you can. We felt like when we thought about that as an, an NRCS and partnership team, we felt like we were we were missing some of that data, some of the things that maybe a producer could think about. And we challenged our staff with that. And Jay Cobb has worked with Mark Larson, one of our hydraulic or hydro, hydrologic engineers. And Mark has put together a decision tool that he wants to present to you today. And it would be something more that you can also see from different locations. We'll share that. But I do believe it will not provide you all the answers. Nothing will. But it will provide you some of the answers. It will help consider, have you think about several things. So with that, I'm going to bring forward Mark, and I really appreciate all the work that he's done on this episode. Thanks, Jeff. So I'm going to share my screen with you, and what I'm going to share is two things. Uh, this is the result of that request by Jeff. Make sure I get the right thing here first. All right, so we put together a spreadsheet to help process the decision of whether or not to install agricultural drainage tile. And this is the opening page on that spreadsheet, the first tab. It's a list of instructions. And I'm going to go through it uh, quickly with you on how it operates, how it works, uh, what the answer you get, what it means. So we'll start with uh, the first thing we want to find is uh, the field that you're interested in tile. And when we look at the field that you're interested in tile, we're going to uh, recommend uh, using WebSO survey. And this tool is available on eFOTOG under section two engineering tools. So you can go there, you can download this tool. Uh, any updates we do to it will be placed there as well. But the first thing you need to do is get a soil survey of the land, you know, if you're interested in tile. And so we've done this for this plot, this uh, quarter. Here, it gives us our soil map units. It gives us our acreage that we have for each soil map unit within that field. And we're going to take that. If I bring my tool back up, we're going to go to this input tab, which is the green tab. So we start at the top. We have our producer name. We have our soil survey area. Uh, in this instance, I'm using Bay County. But there's a nice drop down box. You can choose your soil survey area by county. Uh, I labeled the tract and field. And then once you've done that, you go in here under map unit in these green boxes and you can choose those map units from your soil, web soil survey. And once you've chosen the map unit, you then input the acreages found on web soil survey. So we try to make this as, as easy to use as possible. Once you have all of your acreages in with their soil map unit, we move down here to our crop rotation. Uh, you can do corn, corn, beans. You can do all corn. You can do a variety of different crops. Uh, right now, I do corn, corn, soybeans, and wheat in here as a three crop rotation, which seems to be a very typical, especially in the, those areas that are putting in drainage tile. But you can see there is, there is a list of crops in here that you can use. Uh, I even have alfalfa in here. So there, there's, a, there's a complete list. Now the gray boxes are uh, optional inputs. For right now, I'm gonna leave those blank, but I'll show you how putting something there can change values so quickly. Once you have made those choices, the next thing you're gonna wanna do is go up to data and we're gonna hit refresh all. I've already done this, so I'm not going to do it because it does take a little bit of time to do that. Once it's done refreshing, you'll see that the bottom here where these red values and black values are for your profit, net profit and gross profit. Those values will change. And so then the next step after we refresh it all is we're going to put in the cost of installation of that tile. So you should have a general idea on a per acre basis of what your tile installation is going to cost. 
Uh, over the years, that value can range depending on how many acres you're going to do, uh, how much uh, manual labor is going to be involved, what size of tile. So I've seen costs anywhere from as low as $500 to as high as $1,500. Uh, the, the default value in here is 800, but that again, we can change that value. The next is the practice lifespan. This is how long before you're going to have to replace that tile. Now for us at NRCS, our practice lifespan for a substance drainage tile is 25 years. And that's what we would put in there if it was if you're installing it as a practice for NRCS. But we also rec also recognize that most your subsurface drainage tile is going to last you a good 50 years. I know everything that on my home farm that was installed in the 70s and 80s is still there. It's still fun. So I have 50 years here for the practice lifespan. Also because that also affects our interest rate and our maintenance rate that we're doing next. So if we're purchasing this and we have an interest rate on it, that's the next tab here, the next box, and we're going to input that value. Uh, right now it's defaulted at 8%. And then the next box is our maintenance, and that's defaulted at 2% on an annual maintenance cost. Now once those green boxes are filled, it automatically adjusts the final answers here. If you go to the right here, these white boxes under yield increase, it gives you after the tile is installed, what the expected increase in yield of those crops will be on that field as an average for the field. Okay, so it's a it's a average for the field. Then as we move further down, we have our pre-drainage gross revenue and net profitability for each crop in the rotation. And then we have our post drainage, gross revenue and net profitability for each crop. And then that final line in that table is the change in profit. So how much are we gaining or how much are we losing by putting that tile in? And that takes into account the amortization of the tile over those years. And then the final three boxes here are our years to payback. Now here it says 100 years. It, defa it defaults at 100 years max. I shouldn't say it, it just, once it hits 100 years, it stops, it doesn't go any higher. And we can get values lower than that. <laughs> I've seen some as low as eight, so we can get lower values. But in this field, because we're assuming pattern tile on a quarter section, almost always on every field I've checked, it's come out to 100 years. So what that is saying is, it's gonna take you at least that long before you'll make enough profit, that before you'll make enough money, right? That you're actually above and beyond what it cost you to put that tile. Acres of little to no benefit. These are the acres identified by this spreadsheet that you, in, that you input it at the top, that have little to no benefit as far as hydrology goes for drainage tile, okay, and for yield increase. And the acres with a potential benefit are those acres that have that added yield increase, have a, a significant yield increase. So you're probably wondering, where do I get these numbers from, right? I kind of wanted to go through it real quick for you so you can understand how we're doing this. And next, I'm going to go through the next tab, which does a little better job of helping me explain how we go through, how we get our numbers. So once you've identified your soil map units, the spreadsheet identifies each component within that map unit. And it identifies based on that county's percentages for that component, for that map unit, how much of that component is in that map unit. So let's say for instance, you have a buse loam that has some subcomponents of a barns, okay? And the barns is 10%. So in that buse loam, whatever acreage you put in there, 10% of those acres would go towards the barns component. So all of your components are figured out, and then each component's acreages from each map unit is added back together. So we've now divided it up into components, your, your entire field. These are individual soil components divided up across your field. 
And then from there, we take those components, we determine the drainage. And that's given to us by the soil survey. We have identified the drainage class. Anything that is very well drained or well drained is considered to have no yield effect by uh, installing drainage tile. And those are typically the soils, when it says acres of little to no benefit, that's, those are the ones that are showing up there. Moderately well-drained soils, as you can see on this, we have a defaulted to 10% increase in yield. So any soil components that are labeled as a moderately well-drained soil as their drainage class is gonna get a 10% increase in yield bump. <clears throat> For any soil that is labeled as somewhat poorly drained or poorly drained, we are giving a 20% yield bump. And then any soil that is labeled as a very poorly drained, we are giving a 40% yield. And these yield increases come from research that was done by the University of Minnesota and University of Iowa over the past 20 years. As new research comes out, we'll make adjustments, but that's the research I could find from those universities, that's what I could find. Was a, 20%, 15 to 20% yield bump on those poorly drained, somewhat poorly drained soils. Uh, you also notice on here that we have some of these components are highlighted in pink. The reason they're highlighted in pink is because they're identified as hydric soils. So as we are also concerned about wetlands, we highlight those just so that you are made aware that there's a potential for a wetland in those soils. That's all, it's just uh, just to make you aware, that's it. It, does, it doesn't tell you that there is a wetland. It doesn't tell you anything else. It just says there's a potential. And it's also a good time to, if you're working on this with your district conservationist or your soil conservationist and they see that, they can say, hey, have you done a certified wetland determination on this field, right? It's, a, it's another conversation starter for you. <clears throat> Once we have those that information, it goes into the yields. Now the yields that we are using in this spreadsheet are those taken from the Mitchell Technical Institute's annual reports where they call up producers and ask them what you get for a yield, right? And those are based on crop per county. So depending on which county you chose earlier, it's gonna give you values based on the information they got from that county. And that is gonna be the county average. Okay, so we're looking at the county average <clears throat> based on Mitchell, Mitchell Technical Institute's annual report. And then going further down, when we're looking at the price that we're using for your per bushel or per ton uh, sale of your, of your crop, those prices, I currently have up to 2019 average prices in there. Those are statewide average prices for that year. Okay. They're not specific to a county, they're not specific to a time of year, they're just the average price for the year. And it's updated to 2019. Obviously we're not done with 2020 yet, so I don't have that value in there. Now, that, that's how we're getting our default information. And that's how this thing is calculating its information. If I go back to our input table, there are some things that we can change. So these going back to these gray boxes. If you know what you're getting in that field for a yield prior to putting prior to the installation of your tile, you can put that value in. And it will use that value instead of the county average to determine what your final yield is going to be. So if my county average for Dade County was 148 bushels per acre, and I know that I'm getting 190, just throwing numbers off the top of my head here, I can make that adjustment and everything adjusts. Additionally, if my corn price, my average county corn price is 389, but I know I've already got it for sale for 410, whatever it may be, right? But I know I, I know I know what my price is going to be. I can put that in, and again, that adjusts everything down the line. So we can make these adjustments for every crop, 
on this page. So you can either use the county averages or you can use your own input. Now, so this was a pattern tiled field, the whole quarter. We can also, with WebSoil Survey, and the reason I like using WebSoil Survey for this, is we can say, well, what if, and it's hard to see on this because I don't have it, WebSoil Survey doesn't do a good job highlighting this. What if I'm just tiling some low spots, right? What if I'm, what if I'm specifically tiling certain areas, okay? So if I'm looking at just these low spots, I can go back and we can adjust those values. So I'm gonna open up my second one. There we go. So this is now just looking at that smaller area in the field versus the entire field. And again, we're putting in our soil map units. We got our county, our soil map units, the acres for each one based on that soil survey. And we're making adjustments uh, to our pre-draining yield and our costs. So let's say I'm a little higher for, right? So we can see for corn, let's say I have this higher yield and this higher price, my pre-drainage net profitability is about $372 per acre. My post-drainage net profitability on, that, on those same acres, if I switch down to this smaller area, is 382. So actually, where before, if I pattern tiled the whole field, I was showing a, an, an increase in loss, not an increase in profit. Well, now I'm showing an increase in profit of $10. So it's also a good way to see the difference. So there's two ways to use this. I can use this on my whole field, just see what it looks like. Looking at just the economics of that tile and yield increase. That's all we're looking at. We're not looking at any other benefits from the tile. We're just looking at the economics of the yield increase and the installation of the tile. And I can see how if I just spot tile it, I'm actually going to save more money or earn more money, I should say, especially with corn. And again, if I change the values for the soybean and winter wheat, I'm sure those will adjust as well. So this is a tool, you know, as Mr. Zimprich had mentioned, he's been thinking about for a while, something that he requested that we develop. Uh, this is what we came up with. I've run this through uh, several university and uh, experts in the field already, trying to make sure that I got the number, that I'm using the right numbers and, and getting the information correct. So at this time, I'll take any questions. It is available on the eFOTOG website under section two, engineering tools. <laughs> but currently that's the only place I have it. Because that was, it was determined that we wanted to put it in one place that was, that should be accessible to everybody. <laughs> you go, you go near your DC Yes. Yep. I've already had a couple of DCs that have used it and have run stuff by me already. So I know they're using it. Can you hear me? Acts. You know, we mentioned it was on the uh, electronic field office technical guide, the photog. And Angela had mentioned that there was difficulties in being able to access that. I think what we need to do then is research that, find out why that is, and we may need to provide a link out to all of you. Because yes, this tool will do no good if it's not accessible to people. And we're going to need to make it be accessible. So thank you for that feedback, and we'll work on that. Having the waterway.
So what's the question? Okay, so the question is, uh, why doesn't it address the grass waterway that's being removed to put in tile? Is that, uh, so this wasn't designed to address that issue. I mean, just to tell you flat out, it wasn't designed to address that issue. My hope is that if you're working with your DC on the spreadsheet, that he would or she would address that issue with you as you're talking. Because again, this is this is only meant this is only to be used to, to start the conversation, and hopefully, the NRCS employee you're talking to has a broader knowledge than just this tool, and they can use that knowledge to address grass waterway issues, terracing, uh, wascobs, any other type of practice we might be able to keep or install in the field along with drainage tiles. No, and, and I, understand, I understand that. Uh, that So it's Mike, right? Mike saying that, that, that the only time that farmers are dealing with the DC is if it's a wetland. And I would say that that's an issue more for broader discussion with NRCS as to why farmers aren't communicating with their DCs more often than just wetlands. That's not something that I can address with this tool. I mean, I can put a I can put a disclaimer on there that this tool should be used in discussion with your district conservation. I can add that to the front page, but that again, that's that's not what this tool is intended for. Jonathan, address Mike's question real quick or a comment, and then I also want to. We've had one come in online, so um, number one. When we started working on this and when we put this out and we present this, we realized this discussion would create discussion. And that's good for us. That's healthy for us to have those discussions. So know that it's not ending today, right? We're putting this out there. We'll have those discussions. So Mike, my first comment is it, it concerns me and in a way I would say hurts me here that the only reason you would want to visit with our district conservation dealing with a wetland because I believe that our staff have an incredible amount of knowledge. They can share. So we'll work on that. But another question that came up and was came in online was, does this tool address the environmental costs of tile being installed? And the simple answer is not. And we all know that there are different things. Tools can be very simple and complicated. And this one to me is complicated enough and it's just addressing kind of the economic side of making good decisions. And, and to me, this was about sharing some new information or some information that's really not new, but getting the people to think about it to help them make wise decisions as they look at their land and make decisions on how they want to manage it going forward. So that was the purpose of this. So no, it does not do all of those other environmental things. I think Mike's point was roughly the same thing right? Tile is not a silver bullet. It does not solve all issues. It does not solve ephemeral gully erosion. It does not solve ponding issues. Some of these issues that I worry about is some of these areas may show a positive benefit if they were tiled, but I can also tell you they're still going to pond water in heavy rainfall events. And if they do do that, you're likely to still see a yield reduction that probably would drop you below being economically sound. So all of those things have to be considered. Good discussion. Don't want to cut it off, but I also just want to kind of keep it moving. Are there other questions? 
Any other comments? Know that Mark can help you with this. Get your hands on this tool. If you wanted to demonstrate, if you wanted to observe it with him, we can arrange that. It's a little different now. We had done a fair amount of that with several producers that came and seen Mark, went over it with them. Um, we've had some positive comments that it provided them some information that they that no one else was giving them. It was unbiased, really just looking at numbers that you can put into the system, not somebody telling you that, yes, it's going to provide you an incredible amount of profit, but it does talk about the investment you're making as well. All right. Very good. Thank you so much, Mark. Appreciate it. All right, next on the agenda is a whole lot of program updates. So Mr. Vanderwilt's going to come forward and walk through those with you. You can see he's going to talk about our conservation implementation strategy and then a bunch of program stuff. You have to take it away. All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, glad I could be here with you today. Uh, we'll start out with uh, the conservation implementation strategy. Just a quick update. Um, we did our funding selections back in May. We, we, we selected 16 proposals to move forward this next fiscal year here in uh, 2021, which will start in October. Um, I don't have the list for you yet because I'm still working on some final details with a few of the folks. Once I get those details worked out, I'll get you that final list, which should be at the next state tech meeting. So, you know, November-ish, December-ish, somewhere in there, I'm sure we'll have our next state tech and I will get you that final list. Um, but we do have a couple that are out. Um, so if you see some news releases, I think we have three of them out that are starting to do some outreach, starting to try to work on planning with some producers. We've got one in Charles Mix County um, that's working on some cedar tree removal in a watershed down there. Uh, the Belfouche Irrigation District has also announced their program and getting that one rolling um, to do some irrigation improvement. And then um, the one in, it would be Marshall Day and Spink County, kind of where are those County and we think maybe Brown too a little bit, but right in that area, there's a couple of watersheds where they're going to try to treat some salinity issues. Um, and they're working directly with the Soil Health Coalition on that project as well. And they've done some uh, news announcements and those kinds of things as well. So we've got a couple of them out on the street. I wanted to provide you the whole list, but I'm still working on a couple of details with a few of them. And so I don't have that whole list, so I opted not to share that just yet. So I get those final details and I will certainly have those by the next. State also, most likely by the next state tech meeting, um, we will have our announcement out for essentially two funding that we're going to, you know, make funding support here in 2021. So that that announcement will come out in November. It'll have a due date in April. I don't know exact dates yet. Haven't worked those out, but uh, we'll be looking to partner with folks, get some new proposals. We'll have more money available for. Um, 2022 as well so there'll be a hopefully we'll get a few more people interested kind of get this snowball rolling down that hill and picking up some, some speed as it goes down that hill so any questions on cis and kind of where we're at with that the conservation implementation strategy okay now we're going to get really wild so my staff is not here but they are all online and so jen works is going to be up first we're going to talk equip so Jen's going to join us via Teams here, and she's going to share her screen so you guys can see her handout. And so we're we're going to test this whole technology thing to the max with State Tech here today. So we'll see how this works. I see you, Jen. I don't see your screen yet, but I see you. Yep. Good morning, everyone. And everybody can hear her okay here in the room. I got nods, so I think we're good, Jen. Okay, let me get my screen shared. Hey, can you everybody see the screen? OK. OK, well, I'll start off with equip. Um, like Jeff had said early on the year on the meeting, we started with a lot of um, new software, which delayed our rollout of offering programs for fiscal year 2020. So we kind of <laughs> This is George. Can can you expand that on the screen? Uh, those of us with old eyes have a hard time seeing that. If you could expand it, that would be great. Thank you. That better? Okay. Um, 
it, we delayed our rollout of programs because of the delay in the final rules with some farm bill inform, information. So our programs didn't start in the fall like we normally do. They started in the spring with batching dates and such. So our staff has done an amazing job of getting all of our allocations spent. Um, we ended, and this this is in your handout packet, so I know it's a little bit smaller, but uh, we ended with $17,500,000 uh, as our final allocation. Uh, we had an emergency animal mortality sign up, and that was due to a lot of issues with COVID and shutting down packing plants, and then a lot of hog farmers having to depopulate po you know, their population because they had no place to go with their animals. So we had um, five of those that we approved and funded. Um, we had seven applications, but two of them ended up not having to depopulate, which is why they didn't get funded. So uh, the rest of the fund pools are about the same as previous years. Uh, the one addition or two additions that we had was this prairie pothole wild, water quality and wildlife um, sign up. And that one it was new with the farm bill um, where it was offering some incentives on delaying planting, delaying uh, harvest on prairie pothole areas within the field. The, the wetland size would be two acres or less, um, but you could have multiple wetlands within a field that were enrolled. Uh, we had two applications this year for that with, a, you know, not very large in size. So maybe next year we'll have a little more interest in that particular program. And the other program was our Northern Plains Grassland Bird Initiative that was new um, out in the western part of the state, um, focusing on grassland birds. And that one, we ended up allocating an initial $500,000, adding a few, another $170,000 to it uh, to fund three applications that have more intensive grazing systems to allow uh, development of the different habitat types for, I believe it was five focus species of grassland birds out there. Uh, the rest of the, you know, the rest of the fund pools are very similar to what we've had in the past years. So I can let you look through the numbers. We're going to end the year with about 326 contracts. Um, I know our sheet down here says 331, I believe. Uh, but some with our new software that we have for ranking, uh, an assessment could potentially be funded within multiple fund pools. And we did have about five or six of those this year that were funded out of multiple fund pools, which is why this number is showing higher than what we'll actually have in actual contracts. And that's only because, you know, it was, partially funded in say soil health and the, the general fund pool, wherever they fell within their ruck, uh, because they also included practices that were not offered through soil health or through whatever other fund pool that they, they ended up being in. So anybody have any questions on EQIP? Nobody here in the room, Jen, has okay. her hand up either. One, okay. one, quick com one quick comment I'll make though, Jen, just so that everybody knows, these, these handouts did get emailed out too. So if, if you can't see the screen well, George, or still, or if you want to study it harder, you should, should have gotten an email copy of these as well. Yep. Yeah, and um, 919 is the number of ass assessments that were ranked across all of these fund pools. And some of these fund pools, or some of these assessments, I should say, were ranked in multiple fund pools. Uh, it, this is considerably different than what we've had in past years, where it was basically one application, one fund pool, and that was it. And that's why I said there's, there was some that were funded across multiple fund pools that ended up being one contract in the end, but two funding announcements or two funding options in there. 
so that that makes these numbers a little bit different from la from previous years. We still had 1,100 to a little over 1,100 applications received, uh, and we did a workload prioritization um, on that. So maybe not all applications received were high enough in the workload prioritization to be fully assessed and ranked. So that is EQIP in a, a large nutshell. Um, do you have any questions you don't want to ask today? You can certainly reach out to me and I will let you know or answer any questions. Um, I'm going to cover the RCPP EQIP as well here um, before I jump off. And that was another handout that looks like this one. I will try to make it a little bit bigger. Uh, this is showcasing the um, Duck Sun Limited's two uh, projects that they have. They have the James River and then a Prairie Pothole Working Land Partnership. Um, with the Prairie Pothole Working Land Partnership, that does cover into North Dakota, Minnesota, and Montana as well. So this is just the South Dakota representation of the of what happened in there. Uh, We've had three signups with these two projects now, and the James River, we are fully funded, and we actually borrowed into a little bit of money that was returned through a modification to fund the last one this year. Um, in 2020, we had 20, uh, 20 assessments, and we funded all 20, but one backed out at the end. So we ended up with 19 that we funded through them, that one. Uh, same goes with Prairie Pothole. We ended up with eight assessments and two of them canceled after we funded those as well. So we ended up with six projects funded. Um, and about $70,000 left so that we could potentially have sign up for 2021 on the Prairie Pothole side. Uh, this is George. Do you have an uh, acreage estimate for the, uh, those projects, what the total acreage involved is? Um, I don't have it with me today, George, but I can, I can get it. I can, I can pull it up. I don't off the top of my head. Okay. okay. You might want to include that on a future uh, spreadsheet so we can see how many acres are actually impacted. Thank you. Okay. I guess, um, the only other thing that I have for EQIP is that we are currently working through our payment schedule for 2021 and making any adjustments needed for that. We will probably also convene our program subcommittee group to discuss you know, the, the payment schedule and any other changes that are needed for 2021 here very soon. Jeff, did you have any other comments you wanted to make? Nope, I think that covers equip for us. Anybody have questions here? We're good in this room, Jen. Okay. Anybody? Thanks, Jen. Appreciate it. You are very welcome. All right, so we're going to switch, folks. Um, we're going to switch to Joyce Dravithic. I don't think Joyce has had the opportunity to meet many of you. Joyce is our new CSP program manager. Um, she started, uh, I believe it was late June. Uh, with us here in South Dakota. She came to us from Montana. So she she took over the role that Jessica Mahalski held for several years. And so Joyce is new. She, she uh, <laughs> came at a really great time to get her feet wet as we were trying to uh, get our new CSPs obligated and and uh, get all that accomplished. So Joyce, at, that, at this point, I'll turn it over to you and kind of let you go over your numbers for uh, CSP. Thanks, Jeff. Can you see my screen? Yep, we sure can. Oh, good, okay. I haven't shared this over Teams yet, so it's a trial by error. Hopefully not too many errors. So good morning. Glad to be with you, at least virtually. We'll run through some quick numbers. The CSP renewals came in in May this year. The deadline was in May, and we ended up with, um, we'll cover the, just the renewals first, and then I'll get into the classics. But We had 219 total applications received for the 20 fiscal year 20 renewals. And the initial allocation on that was $18,150,000. So 
So the numbers listed on the table below, this is in your handout also, that that's the initial allocation that was given to each fund pool. And we had at the end of our contracting by the end of July, we had 129 contracts that were obligated totaling $17,338,184. And this covered a little over, four, well, almost 410,000 acres. So um, there were 15 of those that were determined ineligible and then 19 chose to cancel their application. The ones that weren't funded had a choice of being re referred to the next fund funding for the classics. So on down to the classic applications, we actually had. Can you, can you scroll, Joyce? Can you scroll the sheet so they can see? Did that not scroll? It did not. Oh, let's see. Are you seeing this screen? Yep. There okay, you go. let's we'll we'll we're, just switch to this screen. Yep, we're good now. Okay, good. So an initial allocation on the classic CSP 2020-1 classics. That thing will quit bouncing on me. We had $10 million. Um, four weeks in. Um, period, we added another 1.5 million. I wonder if I move this. Did that take it away? No, we're still there. Okay, I don't know why it's jumping on me. I don't either. It is on this end too. So that's weird. I had the other one pulled up if it would just show it. Damn low bid computers. <laughs> I know. They're a pain in the neck some days. <laughs> Joyce, go under the sharing deal and try to uh, share a different screen if you got two screens. I do. Okay, let's open this. It's worth a shot anyways. How's that? There you go. We see it. Oh, good. And it's okay. not bouncing. <laughs> That's good. That's really hard on the eyes. So back to the 2020 initial allocation, we had $10 million we got with our first allocation from headquarters. They gave us another 1.5 million. And then um, about three weeks ago, they gave us another 1.545 million. And so we ended up with a little over $13 million to spend on CSP Classic. We had over a thousand applications. And um, it has 63 obligated here. I, I'm really happy to say that right now we have 86 obligated out of 90. So we've only got four applications that are still at pre-approved or approved. So the field offices have really moved on them in the last week. Um, we had 49 that chose to cancel their application. 22 were determined ineligible. And there were 138 that were actually eligible, but due to funds, we didn't have enough funds to cover everybody that actually ranked high. So this is the number of contracts that were actually funded or will be by the end of the week, hopefully, um, in each fund pool. And then this second column, the total obligation is the money that we were able to spend or should be able to spend by the end of the week in each fund pool. And the third column, the original allocation is what was initially in there. So on each one of those fund pools, we actually went over quite a bit. So that was the good news on what it looked like when we first started out with only 10 million. Future renewal contracts, um, the numbers I came up with, and I don't know how close these really are because Protrax doesn't really work with us sometimes. Um, I had two, 424 active 2016-1 contracts that should be eligible for renewal this fall. There were 349 active 2015s that had extensions that also should be eligible for this fall renewal. But we're still waiting on any guidance from National on these, so um, that's about as much as we know on that right now. 
As far as CSP, the Grasslands Conservation Initiative, um, we have a batching deadline that we were given of October 16th for the 2021-1 applications. And the Farm Service Agency sent out a list of eligible producers on August 14th of 2020. So um, earlier this year in January, 126 contracts were obligated under Grasslands Conservation Initiative. Mm -hmm. And then in April, there were two more obligated. So that's what I have for CSP. And if anybody has any questions, we'll take them. Any questions from anybody here in the room? Online? All right, thank you, Joyce. Um, Welcome. No, no, the only thing I would probably add to that is the renewals have to. Uh, be assessed, ranked, and funded before the end of December. So we know that much. That's all we know at this point. We don't have actual batching deadlines and those kinds of things. Those will come down from headquarters when they when they make those determinations. So, but we do know that we'll have to get those done before October. So the the, the existing contracts that they can renew will expire in December, and we have to do them before they expire. So that's as much as we know on that. So so with that, uh, Brandon Kotke, our easement program manager, has his stuff up, and I'll let Brandon go with his. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Can you hear me all right? Sure can. All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining this morning. Uh, we'll take a little time here to give you a brief update on our 2020 application summary for our easements and water bank programs. So. Um, as you can see here, we actually had a pretty good year this year. We were up to 114 total applications um, across just about 17,000 acres. That's up from about, I'd say, we were all around the mid-60s last year, so we had a pretty good increase in interest uh, in the easement program this year. With the amount of funds that we received, we were able to actually fund seven easements, um, two of them being uh, permanent easements with reserve grazing rights. Both of those combined covered about 857 acres. Uh, we're also able to fund four permanent easements, just under 700 acres, um, and then one um, easement converted from a 30-year easement to a permanent. So pretty big bump in the size of our offers this year. Um, usually we're kind of right around that 100-acre average, but that was we had some pretty nice significantly blocks of offers this year. So we were able to get in right around 1,763 acres. So it uh, should be a good year going forward and hopefully we can look at starting to restore some of those uh, in the next year or so. Um, regarding our ALE, we're pretty excited uh, with the new farm bill. There was a new option this year to uh, go with a program agreement. Uh, we were able to execute one of those with uh, an entity um, and the nice thing about this is it kind of, it gives the state and the entity a little bit more flexibility um, and time with enrolling parcels. Uh, so with that, we'll have about five years to enroll several different parcels um, with this entity across South Dakota. Um, they're pretty excited. They have a pretty large list already of interested applicants. So. As we go into fiscal year 21, we're pretty excited to start uh, getting some of those parcels enrolled and continue to build our ALE program here in South Dakota. Uh, just some restoration and management stats for you for this year. Uh, we actually had some favorable conditions for once, so we had a really productive year this spring with getting some seedings in the ground. Uh, between our federal contractors and landowners together, we got pretty close to about 900 acres actually seeded. Um, and we have about 350 scheduled for this fall and things are looking pretty good there too. So hopefully everything stays on track with the weather and we can get those in as well. Um, here you can see our uh, numbers for the compatible use agreements that we authorized for this year. So right around 114 practices that we approved for the various management activities on just about 4,000 acres as well. So. Again, the nice weather with this year really allowed some of our easement holders to get out there and do some quality management to improve uh, some of our grass stands on our easements. I am going to switch screens here with you quick.
Oh, water bank stats for the year. Uh, we did see a drop in applications this year. Uh, we had a total of 16. Um, and of that one, didn't come up, Brandon. All right, one sec. It's not on our end, I guess. Looks like it's trying to load here. There you go. Okay. So yeah, I can, I can recap that quick for you. Um, 16 total applications that we had this year. Um, we were able to fund all of them but one. Um, one just didn't meet the criteria for the program for the year. So um, still a good chunk of uh, acres there, about 913 acres. Uh, about 13 of those were up in the Day County area and the remaining two were over in Brown County. So. Pretty good numbers there. I think the last thing that I had to share, and I don't have a slide for that or anything, but uh, we did announce here a couple of weeks ago um, our application period for our floodplain easement. So, uh, and the press release went out there. It is open until October 9th. We've had quite a few landowners already contacting us and starting the ball rolling you know, with the flooding and events that we had in 2018 and 2019. Um, there's just a lot of interested parties and in seeing what we can do there to hopefully kind of alleviate, alleviate some of the issues that we have, um, some of our floodplain areas. So that's the update that I had for you guys this year. And if you have any questions for me on uh, any of the easement stuff or water bank, feel free to ask. Anybody in the room have questions? Looks like we're good here. Anybody online? All right, real good. Okay, so yeah. um, last couple or the last quick topic to cover is the Regional Conservation Partnership Program. Uh, quick update on that. We uh, are in the process of writing agreements with two projects that got funded out of the 2019 uh, offer. One of those was with the um, East Dakota Water Development District on the Big Sioux. And the other one was uh, with the Belfouche Irrigation District uh, doing some irrigation work out there. So those two were funded through the announcement that we held uh, would have been last fall, winter sometime. Uh, then this uh, late summer, there was an opportunity for folks that had existing RCPP projects to uh, put their name in the hat for a renewal to extend their project for another five years, get some additional funding. And uh, Rocky Knippling with the Lewis and Clark project was one of our folks that was eligible to do that. And he did, and he was selected for funding as well. So we're working on writing a new agreement with uh, Rocky and that project to do some additional work in the Lewis and Clark area. So as we get those three kind of lined up and ready to go, we'll, we'll certainly provide you guys more information, but this is just kind of heads up that those three got funded this year. And uh, I'm, I'm working on those agreements with those folks right now as we speak. Um, tomorrow, there will be an announcement for some alternative funding arrangements. It's a kind of a side pot of money through RCPP. Uh, we had several uh, partners here in South Dakota put in for those. Uh, you could do state projects or multi-state projects, and so that announcement will come out tomorrow on any projects that we might get funded. So we'll have some, some additional news there, hopefully, with some additional projects getting funded through that. And then currently, a, 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 a class, we call them classics now, a classic sign up is happening for RCPP. So if any of you partners out there are interested in doing a project, uh, this opened up on August 4th, give or take a day or two, and it closes on November 4th. And so you've got 90 days to write a project proposal and put, the, put that all together for an opportunity to get some additional funding for uh, 2021 and beyond. We've kind of been told we should expect somewhere in the $6.6 .6 million range worth of funding if we have applications that are valued that high. So, you know, one of the things we want to really make sure is that we at least make an effort to try to bring those funds here to South Dakota. So I've reached out to a dozen or better partners for sure um, to try to talk about projects. And if I haven't contacted you, I apologize. But if you are interested, let's talk. I've got the announcement. I can send it to you if you can't find it. Like I said, we've got until 
November 4th to get those put together. So if anybody's interested, get a hold of me. Let's talk. And uh, we'll see if we can get some projects rolling here in South Dakota and, and, you know, get an opportunity to put more conservation on the ground. So that was a real quick, brief update on RCPP, but does anybody have questions on that? Anybody online? I just scoured the room here quick. All right, that's my update. So thanks, everybody. It's good seeing you, whether in person or virtually. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff, and appreciate all the updates from Brandon and Joyce and Jen. So as we said early, it was a crazy year for programs, but we uh, definitely succeeded. I really appreciate your comment, George, about asking us about acres impacted. Um, I think it would be good for us to include that on the spreadsheet and show you kind of those impacts that we're having. And I think it would always be good, too, if we could find some ways and time to share some of the individual success stories happening out in the landscape. It really struck me that when Brandon was speaking about, um, you know, the work we've been doing to improve the easement, I've seen some of the pictures, I've not seen the staff showing me what's happening on these easements. And I think it'd be something that all of us in the conservation family would be proud of if we could see those and see how we're improving some of those uh, landscapes across South Dakota. So we're gonna do that in future. We'll make a point to make that happen. Um, I'm going to speak with you real quick about the emergency watershed program. It is an authority that we've talked about with you a few times. Definitely is tied to disasters. So a lot of this is tied to activities that hit South Dakota in 18 and 19. But we have been lucky, I think, to partner with some conservation districts and also a watershed district. And there's a handout in your sheet that talks about those. So we're able right now to work in Jones County, Jackson, Todd, Bennett, and then with the Bruley Watershed District to repair several dams that were severely damaged uh, from those flooding events. We've had auxiliary spillways um, that were damaged, washed out, threatened, and we're going in to get those fixed. So it's been really good. I also know that there's partners online and in this room that have helped us a lot. Angela through the conservation districts and Bill through state has helped us and game fishing parks and others have brought matching funds into the project. So thank you to all the partners that are help us helping us make these happen. These are structures that um, really are key in a lot of communities, you know, the, like the Murdo structure and the Belvedere Dam. They're key for those communities. They also provide flood control benefits downstream. So it's really good for us. So the key here is. If you are in an area that has one of these events that we always hope we can avoid in the future, we're optimistic that this program might be able to help us. But Jay Cobb has kind of been leading the way on that effort. All right, questions on that program at all? All right, next we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the Conservation Reserve Program. Uh, as you know, we provide technical assistance a program that is administered by the Farm Service Agency. Uh, Owen and uh, other leaders from FSA were unable to be with us today, and I don't believe that they've joined us online, but I do know that we have Jessica and Brandon that are able to kind of just give you some, a little bit of an update about the uh, uh, number of plans and the impact that some of that's had. So, yes, I'm going to throw that to you. And to Brandon, and you can share whatever you had planned and talk a little bit about the effort. Again, we're definitely not still the Federal Farm Service Agency, but we knew it would be a topic that you all would want to talk about. And an incredible amount of work has been going on in this program uh, this year. So big interest in South Dakota. So Jess, thank you. Okay, actually, I do believe that Owen and Don were able to join. So I Great. want to make sure that I give them an opportunity um, Owen or Don, if you have any updates before um, I just give a little brief uh, bit of information. Please, Owen, do that for us. I'm sorry, Eric. I had a phone call come in as I was trying to do multitasking. So please refresh what you wanted the information updated on. Well, I just wanted to give you the opportunity to um, say anything that you wanted to say as far as a CRP update is concerned. Okay. Um, you know, we don't have, of course, we had a, a huge workload lift uh, recently with the conclusion of the continuous sign-up deadlines. 
grasslands, general sign up, ship, prep, all of those rolled into one. Um, we don't have those finalized numbers. We're still moving towards the finish line. Had great uh, working relationships with uh, NRCS and our conservation partners through this process. And, um, you know, again, that's why I wasn't on the agenda is we wouldn't have those finalized numbers, but uh, can field any questions or concerns if there was anything related to the sign up and maybe help address some of those concerns. Any rough numbers of what we're looking at for acreages? Yeah. Drive through the I don't at this time know that I would feel comfortable sharing. When might you have those numbers? Um, it'll be the probably the first week after September, the fiscal year. So after October 1, we should have those numbers quasi finalized. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I don't have more to offer, but I guess that's okay. I'm sorry. No, George, one more question here. Do you, do you have any uh, uh, feedback on another general sign up? If there's going to be another general sign up in 2020? Uh, yes. The 2018 Farm Bill. Uh, basically laid out that timeline so it'll be a reflection of what we've experienced this year so there'll be uh, that December-ish start for the general sign up then it'll be the grasslands continuous for re-enrollments will start again around that April date so the same timelines we realize this year will be experienced in 2021 as well Okay, thank you, Owen. Um, there was just a couple points that I wanted to make sure I brought to everyone's attention. Um, again, don't want to steal Owen or, or Don's thunder here, but um, for grassland CRP, um, many of you might be aware that South Dakota actually had about one third of the accepted offers. So um, that was a, a big workload for both Farm Service Agency and NRCS staff and to make sure that we get um, some really good management um, on those grassland CRP offers. We've been working with our producers on either prescribed grazing plans or um, a haying plans for after the primary nesting season. Um, and then Dawn did provide today that we have about 3,500 accepted offers right now. Um, I know we've still got a lot of signatures um, being um, received by FSA and NRCS staff to wrap up our CRP workload. Um, again, I would echo um, Owen's um, thoughts on the great partnership that we have with um, FSA, NRCS, and then a, a, a lot of other um, partner staff that have been assisting us with the workload and moving around as we need it. So, um, but again, Owen and, and Don and Brandon and I will all work together to get you finalized numbers. Um, in the near future. Uh, this is George, I guess, for anybody. Um, uh, do you anticipate any movement on the rental rates for CRP? Um, they're revisited every year, again, according to statute, but it's, it's a lot of it's based off of the National Ag Statistics Service data. And again, those factors that were attributed to those rental rates are, again, statutory with the 85 or 90 percent of those rates. So, again, a lot of that's driven outside of the control of the county committees or the state state office personnel for FS for the rental rate that's posted. Uh, do you have any idea where they're going for on this year or next year? I don't have any of the data currently, um, and I guess maybe the, no, I don't have a feel for which, if we're going up or down based on rental rates this past year.
Very good. Any other questions in the room on Sirpi? Mike, go ahead. You bet. So the question was, Owen, in case you didn't hear it and repeating it for the group was, Mike Schmidt was asking about, there's been discussion about having CRP have a little bit more of a working lands approach. And I think the grassland portion of CRP is an example of that. So Owen, do you want, want to share at all some of the, the ways that you all are seeing uh, management of CRP change and maybe even how you're seeing it with this new sign up and some of the things that are allowed. I think it would be great to share that with the group. Sure. Um, the 2018 Farm Bill expanded the authorities of non emergency haying and non emergency grazing on all CRP lands. Of course, we, in addition to that, uh, presented to the State Technical Committee a couple meetings ago the proposed required management that would be on those CRP lands. And part of that was that the haying and grazing activities could satisfy that requirement. Uh, with that, the, the frequency is once every other on the grazing aspect and once every three years on no more than 75% on the haying aspect. Um, so that quasi, you know, could have the appearance that it's more of a working lands. There's more availability for access to that acreage to, uh, to help with a farming operation. Uh, and again, you touched on it, Jeff, with the grasslands, that that is a working lands, um, helps manage that acreage with turnout dates and, and grazing plans on the acreage, or again, the haying aspect on stubble height and things like that. Um, so I guess those would be the, the big things to refresh everyone's memory on what was a part of that 2018 Farm Bill and the, the capabilities that are out there now on CRP. Brandon, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? You know, I don't, Jess. I think you guys have covered everything that I would have mentioned. Okay. We can't hear you, Jeff. Okay, now I'm unmuted, eh? Am I coming through now? Super, thanks. I don't think I touched a button and I, somehow I, I muted myself, so unusual. Most of you that know me would think that there's no way you can mute Zim. She could be my wife. You're exactly right, Carl. She is a powerful woman. So anyway, um, I would just share that, um, you know, as we've talked in previous state technical committee meetings, that we know that our South Dakota landscape was formed with it being used. And so, you know, I'm anxious to continue to work with you all um, and Farm Service Agency as we find ways to manage these lands better and care for them. It'll be good. Any other questions on CRP? If not, um, I will take you to our last topic on the agenda before we have root time for questions. Is, sure, and that is uh, our wetland compliance uh, workload. I don't sure. have this on the screen available for you but you should have handouts that were sent to you all. And then there's handouts here for the audience. And if some of you don't have these that are with us joining us, please let us know and we can get a hold of you. Uh, just kind of a real quick uh, review and cat re recap, I guess, as I'd share that right now, as of uh, the data and Kathy, I'm looking at, so I'm looking at a few of these numbers and I see that we, Oh, yeah, that's right. Sorry. I'm looking at some numbers and I'm confusing myself. So this is data as of August 1. We didn't have yet the September 1 data to get it out ready for publication. But as of September 1, since October 1 of 19, we kind of add that data up. We have 222 
wetland determinations that are in progress. And if you look at the chart on the bottom, it would show you that almost half of those are less than um, two months old. And then the rest kind of scatter out. So all of them are within that six month range. Very few numbers are in the old. We've, re we've completed about 1300 determinations so far this year. That includes some that were carryovers from 2019 and we've received almost 1,200 applications. And there's some data on there as far as our um, 569 or our uh, when we have reports of possible violations that we follow up on. We've also included for you the four maps that show uh, work on backlog. Overall total backlog is the first map, second is backlog that's older than 60 days, um, and then received applicate or received requests, and then the last are processed requests. So got that numbers out for you, um, and it just kind of shows those numbers for the state. So once again, our compliance team led by D. Kabik is doing a great job of staying up on the requests, um, keeping them young, getting out there and doing that. That team has also taken on a lot of the workload for highly erodible land determinations and also our compliance reviews that go along with our highly erodible land. So that team is actually taking on more of that compliance workload giving our team, our field office team, more time to be able to spend on conservation issues and things like that. So any questions at all related to compliance? All right, thank you. That brings our agenda to close. Um, are there any other topics that you all here in the room or uh, joining us virtually would like to bring forward. Seeing none here in the room, um, are there any others that you uh, virtually, not having anybody speak up? I really would appreciate any feedback that you can either give us right now on how this meeting was conducted virtually, how you thought it went, um, suggestions for improvements. Also know that you could send those directly to myself or to Kathy Irving and let us know kind of just how we can make it be more efficient. These are kind of crazy times. And I know that we've had, by doing it this way, we've allowed a lot of you to join us that probably would not have been able to, not only because of COVID, just because of travel distance and schedules. So that's a good part of it. Um, I do come from a little bit of the older side of the crowd so that I do enjoy the face-to-face -face and that interaction. And I feel like I hate that we're, we would lose that, but I do see that this has potential to make the state technical committee be a little bit bigger. Um, I heard at one time we had about 40 of you that were joining us virtually. And I don't know how many are in the room here, maybe 20, something in that um, realm, maybe a little bit more than that. So if we had a total of 60 to 65 people join us, um, for a state technical committee, that would be a pretty large state technical committee meeting for us. So that's good, right? Having us more involved. So I think what we'll, we may have to continue with this format, offer both options, but definitely do what we can to make it be the most productive as we can. And so maybe that's going to be more sharing of things on the screen and things like that, just so that you all have that in front of you. Any comments that any of you would like to share right now just about? Um, how we offer this to you today. Jeff, I don't have a comment, but I do have an acre count for the RCPP equip contracts this year. And we did, um, we have treated acres of 15,600, just, just shy of 15,600 acres for RCPP equip. Very good. George is giving a thumbs up. Appreciates that head and uh, nodding his head. So thank you. Very good. All right. Kathy did say we're getting some comments sent in. Those will be great. Continue to please do that. And we'll take all this information, put it to good use. And I'm going to kind of end on this topic. I kind of had to giggle a little bit to myself. It kind of goes along with, I say, saying I'm in old school. Vanderwilt's talking about all our programs now have this classic term to them. And the classic kind of refers to the, the way it used to be, or the old version, right? So I'm thinking 
that maybe I should start to refer to myself as a soldier. And then I was thinking a little bit, and what really made me giggle is thinking that if my mom was still alive, she would remind me, yeah, Jeff, you're really a classic. And it wouldn't be in a real flattering tone of voice. So anyway, thank you all for those of you that are younger and newer, and for those of us that are classic, thank you so much for all you do for conservation in South Dakota. We appreciate you much. We've accomplished a lot this year, a lot still to do, but I think we're on a great path to doing more. I'm really, really, really excited about what's happening with some of our focused efforts. The conservation implementation strategy really gets my blood boiling and pumped up because I see folks focusing on that. And you're going to be interested to see more of those. And Jeff's going to talk to you more about it. that announcement's coming out soon. And he mentioned that. So be working on that. And that's really leading us to take on more RCPP in South Dakota, getting us ready for that. And we're seeing more of that happen now with partners. I think that real focused approach, um, really addressing some individual resource concern in specific areas can really help us show some um, advantages and payoffs that conservation does, not only for all you individual producers in the room, but also for the greater public as well. So we're going to continue to work on that. I'm really optimistic about that going forward. So with that, thank you all. If there's no other questions or comments. Enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. Take care.